Alfred Flechtheim was a visionary. He saw the promise, he saw the excitement of the young Cubist artists, and he brought that excitement to Germany and indeed across Europe. There's no doubt that Alfred Flechtheim helped to mold and change art history. He supported the avant-garde movements which have gone on to become the staples, the mainstays of the great museums worldwide. In the years before World War I, Alfred Flechtheim was a grain dealer in Dusseldorf in Germany. But having become an earnest collector of contemporary art in Paris, he decided to set aside his family business and become an art dealer and set up his eponymous gallery in Dusseldorf. As a dealer, Alfred Flechtheim was a trailblazer. He's one of the first people to bring avant-garde Cubist art to Germany, but he was also a champion for the artists he represented. He was an early dealer for Juan Gris, for Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque, and he publicized their work and he managed to bring it into the general consciousness in Germany. He also started an art magazine called Kreschnet in Germany, which was the place where artists wanted to be seen. He was one of the first people to commission Hemingway to write short stories for his magazine. He hired Marston Hartley, the great American artist, to write for his magazine on the contemporary art scene in Paris. He was pulling all these threads together to advance his artists' reputations and also to sell amazing paintings. But he was also famously both gay and Jewish. So when the Nazis came to power in 1933, he was very early on their list of public enemies. He had to flee for his own life, and he left Dusseldorf and moved to London. Flechtheim is a seminal figure in introducing the avant-garde to the marketplace. Some of the most radical new imagery being produced in the early 20th century is being created by artists in Germany and Austria. This painting is one of Kokoschka's greatest masterpieces. In 1910, he's at a sanatorium in the Alps near Mont Blanc, accompanying his patron, Adolf Loos. While not sick himself, he finds his subject matter among the patients of the sanatorium. Kokoschka meets Joseph de Fezensac and his wife. He falls in love with the wife and decides to paint portraits of them both. His image of Joseph is anything but sympathetic. Kokoschka describes him as effeminate, degenerate, with a yellow skin that looks like a wax model. What is so powerful here is the way that Kokoschka seeks to strip away the social masks that we wear and get to the spiritual skeleton of the person he's portraying. He calls these works soul paintings. Kokoschka creates a new technique to reflect the new kind of subject matter that he's painting. He works directly onto the surface of the canvas itself. He manipulates the paint in a variety of very unorthodox ways. Some areas of the painting are created through thick impasto. Look at the jacket. The way this is created is actually by scraping away, using his fingers, using the end of his brush, using anything to hand, to create an image out of absence. He does this because his goal is to create a very direct and unmediated representation. Look at the background. There's an almost filigree-like web of arabesques which are scratched right across the surface of the canvas itself. Kirshner's The Soldier's Bath is one of the great images of World War I, but there's not a trench or a gun or a tank in sight. In 1915, Kirchner has had a breakdown and been invalided out of the army, having initially enlisted as a driver. He paints only two images of his military experience, the soldier's bath and also this extraordinary self-portrait where his right hand has been replaced by a bleeding stump. World War I was a, a new kind of war, a modern war on an industrial scale. Kirchner's experience of basic training was a completely dehumanizing one, and I think that's what this picture captures. The idea that these new recruits have been stripped of all identity, of all personality, all their features are the same, all their bodies are the same. They've been taken away from their personalities and turned into animals, ready for the slaughter. The way that Kirchner uses the perspective here is to create an atmosphere of oppression and claustrophobia. They're being watched over by a commanding officer who, with his shiny boots and whack moustache, heightens this sense of, of powerlessness. This is a vision of hell. There's a touch of the satanic about this figure crouching, his face silhouetted against the fire of the stone. Kirshner learns that war dehumanizes men. I've become half mad, he says. You see nothing but masks, no faces any longer. 
The way that he organizes his figures always has a great sense of rhythm to it. These heads almost feel like a classical freeze, but one infused with horror. Both of these remarkable paintings were in museums until very recently. The Kokoschka was in the Moderna Museum in Stockholm, and it had been in their collection since the 1930s. Until very recently, the Kirchner was in the collection of the Guggenheim Museum here in New York, and prior to that was in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art again in New York. When we look at these works today, we can see how shocking and powerful they are in 2018, but we had to imagine what they were like in Dusseldorf in respectable bourgeois society in the 1920s. One of the exciting things about working with the Flecktime family and with these masterpieces is that we're actually returning the mark of Alfred Flecktime to these artworks. It's one of the greatest names of the 20th century, and by returning his name to these paintings, we're actually returning part of their history. Mm -hmm.